Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I want to welcome you to our Bible study here at Sierra Norwood Calvary uh, Baptist Church. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we welcome everyone. So, uh, Brother Earl, you open us a word of prayer, please. Okay, let's pray. Almighty God, we want to just thank you, Lord, for sparing us. We want to thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Our Father, we know you're a great God. You're a wonderful and a mighty God. Lord, we want to just continue to acknowledge you and give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Lord, we pray as we continue in this Bible study that you just continue to bless us, open our ears and our hearts and our minds and our spirit to receive your word. Lord, we want to <clears throat> pray for the one who break bread with us tonight, Reverend Chisholm, Lord, we pray that you just continue to bless him and use him mightily in your kingdom. Lord, we pray that we'll be receptive to your word and that we'll all participate of our fathers. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and jump right in. Everybody knows how we uh, how we proceed. If you have a question, just wave your hand, use the little icon or put it in the chat and you will be uh, acknowledged. I don't have any announcements. Um, hope to see you on, on Sunday, God willing, at church. And um, Monday is uh, the day they set aside to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. So uh, hopefully you have a good day off and hopefully a little productive as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Reverend Trudem. Thank you, my brother. Let me just try to organize the screen here. All right. I don't think anybody who has been exposed to my ministry from pulpit or lectern would be in any doubt that I'm very obsessed with the enterprise of teaching, learning. So the dis disgruntlement of some people would much prefer me to be a preacher rather than a teacher. But that's their problem, not mine. I want to infect everybody, especially family Bible or teachers and other Bible school teachers with the virus of obsession with Christian education. I promise you something of a shocker before the study is finished tonight. And you'll just have to take it by faith that the shocker that I will share with you is something that I've shared and something that I've believed and sustained as a view for all of my almost all of my years as a Christian. So then let me explain the first of my two main burdens this evening. Christian education, sorry, it should have been done a little bit, uh, defined. And then the other one eventually will be Christian education defended. Those several writers have influenced my thinking about the subject. My own working definition of Christian education reworked, reworked by a suggestion made by a principal at the Sligo Villa All Aid School years ago is this. Christian education is the process of sharing Christian truth and values designed to cause the learning of said truth and values, thus fostering Christian growth to maturity. If you probe my definition, you will appreciate that there are certain basic assumptions within it. Christian education is a process, a lifelong, time-consuming, but necessary process. Some people, a humbug process for some. Sharing Christian truth and values presupposes an understanding of said truth and values, not always there in the minds of people who are even teaching or lecturing. But Christians need to take time to make sense of the fundamentals of their faith. That's why I become concerned when I hear us reading scripture imprecisely, because imprecise reading goes hand in hand with reading me with um with reading meaningfully or less meaningfully as we ought the goal of christian education is to help people to think more christianly 
an awkward adverb, I know, to think more biblically and to allow the spirit to trigger spiritual truth and progressive growth in Christ. Christian education then is the church's supreme task. Let me be blunt here. The church that is not educating might just be simply entertaining. So let me go now to my second and final main burden for our study this evening. Christian education defended. If you take my definition seriously, then it, it should be easy for you to see that sharing to influence mind and life highlights the cruciality of teaching learning. Teaching learning are fundamental and foundational in scripture and critical for godly living. The transformation in Romans 12 2 comes not by renewing of your emotions, nor by renewing, re, re, renewing of your feelings, nor even of your heart or soul, but by renewing of the mind, the control tower that Christian education affects and impacts. The spiritual warfare of 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and following has nothing textually to do with fasting and casting out demons, but specifically speaks about demolishing specious arguments, challenging systems of thought that hold people's minds and, and lives in error and exposing anti-God arrogance from those who are not particularly keen on religion generally or Christian truth in particular. That biblical task, friends, is Christian educational warfare, oiled by the Holy Spirit. Let me share with you now some insights I saw highlighted first by Bruce Wilkinson of Walks with the Bible Ministries years ago when I did some training by them. This is the start of my defense of the central and crucial nature of Christian education. Ponder the Christian education implications of Romans 12, 2 and 2 Corinthians 10, 4. I did that in passing, 2 Corinthians 10, Romans and 12, 2 as well. But look with me now at Deuteronomy 4, 1. The KJV says, quote, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you, end quote. 5.1, that's at the top, but it's covered by the screen sharing thing. Quote, and Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. These two texts, like no other, communicate God's philosophy on the link between teaching and learning. They look similar in structure, and they are related as well in sentiment, as I hope to show you now. Both words, teach and learn, have the same root or stem in Hebrew. Let's check the keenness of your eyes now. I know most of you have no clue about Hebrew, but just work with me. I won't go over your head. Did you have your handouts with you, by the way? Anybody has a handout? No, don't be afraid to answer. I can remedy that easily. I can send you the, the PowerPoint and send you the... I sent them to uh, Natalie two weeks ago and forgot to mention to her, like Monday, that she's to send to you the handout that I had. I think, she, I think she sent them out. Um, it's probably in everybody's okay. email. All right. So check your email. And I'll send this, this slide so you can fill in. All right. So both words have the same root, the same background in Hebrew. And I'm going to guide you to some things now. So on screen, you're about to see two Hebrew words displayed. Now, they look like drawings. Take them as drawings. Don't worry yourself too much about them. Now, here is a little crash course in reading Hebrew. Hebrew, like all other Semitic languages, 
all other Semitic language is read from right to left. Sounds weird. The Indo-European languages that we're accustomed to, like English, you go from left to right, but Hebrew is from right to left. So the first letter in this word in Hebrew is the one on the right. So you have one, two, three, four letters. Forget the dots and the lines underneath the letters for the time being. They are not valuable for our purposes this evening. But just look at the, there are four letters there. And this other one now is another Hebrew word. One is learn. The one that just came on is learn. I'm sorry. Yeah, the one that just came on is learn and the bottom one is teach. Now, if you, if you look at them closely, remember you go from right to left. So the bottom one has one, two, three, four letters called consonants. The top one has one, two, three, four, five, six consonants or four letters, six letters, right? But look at them closely. Check your eyes and see if you notice anything about the two words. Give you a minute to look closely and see if you notice anything. You can't be wrong here. It is what you notice, not even if it is not what I want you to notice. What I want you to notice is not important. What do you see in those two words that strikes you as suggestive or significant or possibly important? Look at the two words again. Look at the, each letter. The top one has one, two, three, four, five, six letters. The bottom one has only four. But look at them closely. Anybody sees anything of significance? The second, third, and fourth coming from the right are, the shapes are similar. Right. The second, third, and fourth consonants are exactly the same, which means that both words, both teach and learn, have the same root. So if they have the same root, what is the difference between teach and learn? Is what you might be asking yourself quite rightly in your mind. So let me just um, go on a little bit further now and clarify something for you. The basic meaning of the stem, if you were to put these in English letters, this letter is L, L here as well. This letter is M, M here as well. This letter is, is, are you seeing the pointer by the way? Yes. This letter is D, D here as well. So the basic root of these two verbs would be lamad in English. So teach and learn have the root lamad. Now, what is the difference between them? What differentiates them if they have the same root? It's the form of the verb. This one is called in Hebrew, the PL. The PL has a special meaning. It means that whatever the root is, is intensified or is strongly causative of the basic root. The basic root is to teach. In the PL is intensified teaching, which is what we call learning. So the two words are related in that regard. To busy yourself. I think I may have it on right. The key notion of the PL of a verb is to busy oneself eagerly with or to cause the action of the root or stem. The root or stem is, is teach. The PL means that you're eagerly, intensively causing the action of the root or causing learning to take place. So then biblically to teach is to cause learning. So the old adage which people who have done studies at teachers' colleges learn, if the teacher has not, if the, if the student has not learned, the teacher has not taught. No matter how you're busy yourself, if you're not causing learning to happen biblically, you're not really teaching. You might be using a lot of words, your, your gestures, your antics on stage might be good, but if nobody is learning anything, you have not taught in the biblical sense of the word. Deuteronomy 6.1, look at it. Teach and live are prominent again, just as in 
and 5.1. To teach you that you might do them is equal to cause you to learn and live what God has revealed to you. So here, it seems as if God has an obsession and probably has infected me with that obsession of causing learning to take place. I know people don't come to church to learn. They come to have a good time. And so I think that first Sunday when I preached by you, I think one or two persons or maybe more were a little bit upset that not only was I too short, but I was not preaching. I was just simply in their minds teaching as if I did something wrong in the house of God. So Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 12 can be summed up this way. Quote, be obsessed privately and publicly with God's directives. You put it as a frontispiece on your forehead. You attach it to your clothing. You put it on your house. You put it on your door. You put it on your gate because you want people to be obsessed with what God has commanded them to do. Take a quick look at 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, I think the KJV says. But interestingly, the first word in the original Greek is not a word for study, but a word which means do your utmost, strain every nerve. To do what? To make yourself approved before God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can't do that unless you give study a serious effort on your part. By the way, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, the Great Commission, I did a session on this a few weeks ago. The single command in the text, as I told you then, and I remind you now, is make disciples. How do you do that? By teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And uh, lo, I am with you until the end of the age, until time ends. This is our educational mandate from our Lord Jesus Christ, that we should continue to teach people, make them disciples or students, and baptizing them and um, teaching them. So then, here's my shocker. As a tool of Christian education, that is sharing understood truth and values for mind and life change. The Sunday school exceeds the pulpit in impact. Might be hard for some of you to swallow or digest or believe, but trust me, all educational practitioners will tell you this, that in a school setting, it is the most effective way of educating people, of connecting teaching with learning in a structured way. And I'm going to share with you the advantages of Sunday school over the pulpit. Think about the pulpit, the average pulpit. The pastor or the guest preacher is facing a, mul a multitude or even a small grouping of people of various interests in church, various interests in the word of God, at various levels of understanding of the word of God. And so the one pill is supposed to minister to the needs of all of those varied people. Only by the miracle of the Holy Spirit does the, ser the average sermon work in terms of educating and impacting the lives of people. But well, watch now as I share with you the advantages of the Sunday school over the pulpit. The advantages of Sunday school. One, small class size. Not 150 people, not even 50 people. And they are streamed by age and at times also by gender thus increasing the potential for the understanding of material. When you have the, the, the uniformity of the group in terms of age and gender, you use language appropriate to that age, and you can also cater to language um, keel towards the gender or the genders in your group. Usually all male class, all female class is what we find. At adult level, then it's a mixed gender. You have male and female. More scope for a wide array of teaching methodologies, including interactive learning. You can ask the class to dramatize the lesson for next week by telling them the title of the lesson and giving them some basic material about the lesson. They dramatize it by exercising themselves in the drama 
they are inculcating more of the material in their brains than they would just by listening to you. To create interest in the lesson, arrest and hold attention and impact mind and life. I've seen Sunday school teachers dramatize aspects of the lesson and people are more keen on drama as a means of communication than just a straight dialogue or just a straight lecture. It allows for regular use of feedback and testing as learning options. I don't know if you have learned if you don't ask me a question and if you don't do exams in school, they don't know if you have really mastered the material. Sunday school allows you these luxuries. It allows for greater awareness of students, general and individual needs and interests. My eyes are compromised, but even the brightest 2020 vision pastor or preacher can't see everybody's emotional reaction. A tear at the back of the hall, he would miss or she would miss completely. In the Sunday school class, when they are near to you, even your, your eyes are as bad as mine, the chances are greater that you might see that a, a Sunday school student is fidgety, maybe under conviction, or the person is crying because the text has come home to him or to her. These are significant advantages of the Sunday school class. The use of structured lessons, that is pre-prepared quarterly material, allows for greater consistency of quality in the content that is shared. Not every pulpit is properly prepared. I've heard people who are sustained the view in their denomination, this is the view that you don't have to prepare a sermon, you just go up there and stand up before the lectern with a mic before your mouth and the Lord will give you absolute rubbish. There's not one scrap of scripture that supports that. The, the thing of being unprepared is when you're tried, as you're assailed in the first century world, Lord said, don't even think what you're going to say when they bring me before the magistrates. At that hour, the Holy Spirit will give you a word to say. Like he did with Paul, when Paul was in, on trial, the Lord gave him conviction about what he knew very well, about his journey, his conversion, to the extent that a trial judge came under conviction and say, in a little while you hope to make me a Christian. And Paul says, well, I would hope that would be the case, Your Honor, that you would not only be almost a Christian, but altogether, like me, a Christian, minus the prison jewelry. That is the chains that they had him in. So my friends, I'm just saying that we have to remember that visual signs of conviction and other responses can be more easily detected in a Sunday school class than from the pulpit. For these reasons and more that you probably can come up with, the Sunday school is far superior as a Christian education medium than the average pulpit. Well, I, I think I went through this. The supreme command of Jesus to the church, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, is more educational, make disciples, teaching them than evangelistic, winning converts. Of course, as you make disciples, you'll be winning converts at first, but then you have to grow them into disciples. And that means teaching them solidly, seriously, and over a lengthy period of time. The Sunday school teacher, properly and progressively trained, has the potential to be a more effective Christian educator than the pastor in the average pulpit. That is going to be hitching your craw for a long while, but just bring it up, chew on it, think about it, and it will eventually go down into your body because it is true. The Sunday school teacher, hear me, properly and progressively trained in teaching mechanism, methodology, has the potential to be a more effective Christian educator than the pastor in the average pulpit. In the average pulpit, the pastor who has even gone to college can cool out and studies nothing else since graduating from college, has read no other book than the ones he struggled with or she struggled with while in college. But you have to be progressively learning. If you're not growing in the educational material that you ought to be teaching, you're going to grow stiff and dead and your people will be drinking from a, 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 a cistern that is not refreshing, that is not... Um, providing good, clean, nice water. It's just a dead, dead stream, dead water. So I'm going to stop there and open now for your questions, your comments, and your observations. And I'll send these slides to you so you can probably fill in your, your, um, your blanks in your handout that is awaiting you in your, in your email.
All right. Any questions, comments, observations? Anybody? Turn off this light, it's burning my eyes. I have one, but I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> no, don't wait. Go ahead. The, the others are not ready, otherwise, they will talk. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> you know, I have done both. The Lord has allowed me to preach, and He has allowed me to teach. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I can ag agree to some extent that. Teaching on a wall is 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 broader than most of the time than than I believe than preaching. Mm -hmm. But one thing when it comes to preaching, and and then when the preacher asks for a moment of decision, mm -hmm. and I believe the great thing with the, with the, with the preacher opposed to the teacher, we do have the teacher always, um, you know, reinforcing our are preaching the gospel and asking for an altar call. Mm -hmm. so, so that's just my observation because I've done both. But I feel a greater obligation when I'm preaching to, you know, proclaim the gospel, you know, and, 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 and ask, uh, you know, ask anyone Make who want to receive call. Jesus as Lord and Savior. Right. And that can be added to a teaching enterprise as well. But you are dead right. I think the preacher is more minded to make an altar call than yeah. the teacher. But the, it's not exclusive to the preacher. It depends on what text you're, you're preaching on. Um, Someone in, some, in the chat put, preachers are teachers. Right. Sometimes if you ask them what's the difference in their <laughs> mind between a preacher and a teacher, it's going to end up to style. But then I... I, I I agree in a sense with Brother Earl, but then also you can look at where uh, it goes back to what you were saying that um, with the smaller size and you know paying attention or having awareness of those in your class, you 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 can still have a a, a kind of a I guess altar call for yeah, say you can stop in, the in, lesson. in the lesson or you know you can come and say hey Johnny, you know I saw everything all right you know did you want to you know make a, a decision for the lord and you know johnny can say yes yeah or you I mean, can ask him to see you right after class right because a lot of those are done i know i know for us when we were doing uh, vacation bible school that was always a part of it mm -hmm. the classes that you know and some of the kids who come um would say yes i would want to follow jesus and you know we would try to inform the parents because you know some of them didn't come to, to church or come to our church mm -hmm. and you know, try to follow up after there, but it it can be done as well in the in in the Sunday school class. Yeah, Sunday school class. It's just it's just you know, like 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 I said, you know, if you were because of the small size, you can probably be made aware if you're aware of what um, is going on or like how the lesson or you just talking is has affected um, the, the students. Student. Oh yeah, but yeah, it's it's. it's 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 from the from the pulpit. Yes, it can be more effective, you know, because um, that's you feel that's part of your responsibility. Mm -hmm. I I think that um, sometimes uh, we preachers uh, don't see ourselves in the role as a, a teacher dealing with uh, you know a particular topic or or subject, but that what we try to do, it would appear to me, and I think I fall into that bracket too, is that I, I need to try to make the word attractive to reach the people and 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 reach, touch their trouble spots. Their hearts, yeah. Uh, and then you ask, ask them to respond, uh, and that is to accept Jesus Christ. Whereas mm -hmm. the, the, the Sunday school teacher is is uh you know prepared a lesson and trying to to share it to sort of educate and they, they are thinking most of the time that everybody in that class is already a Christian and and therefore they are not seeking to win them to Christ but indeed to strengthen them maybe they do have all the skills and so on that are necessary because um in, in a lot of ways some of us pastors have not gone to the, the extent that we should 
to try to um, develop our leadership to that point where you know they consider themselves or see themselves as teachers when they take care of a Sunday school class. Mm -hmm. Someone in I'm the definitely. chat, sorry before you respond, somebody in the chat said, I am a Christian and I approve this teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it, it means that sometimes we have to, I, I think we have to periodically have teacher training sessions for Sunday, Family Bible or teachers. It's not yes. fair to, to put them in a task and don't keep on equipping them. Yes. Periodically, we should do these teaching sessions for the Sunday school teachers or the family Bible or teachers, as we call them in Baptist circles in Jamaica. And I guess some, a, a, a lot of times, which is why I know we, we push Bible study um, a lot. And I know since we've kind of started back up our Sunday school is right now, it's just one kind of setting right before service. But what's important is that it gives people an opportunity to, to ask a question. Or for you to, or for you to pose a question, to get mm -hmm. to get feedback um, mm -hmm. from what you are are teaching, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and like you said, it could foster more understanding. That's right. You know, because I know since since we started with you, you know, uh, the questions that have been asked here a lot has been you know, our eyes have been opened for a lot of things. You know that maybe we were looking at things a completely different way, and you know like you always suggest you know we go and we check for ourselves and go you know what you know that's that's you know the right way to 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 look at look at it mm -hmm. but um well, i guess some people are afraid to ask questions at times because they fear of you know looking silly or dumb yeah right right but um i i tell people all the time don't don't worry ask your question yeah because if it's seven of us in here Four other people may have the same exact question. Yeah, but they're not courageous enough to voice. Right. It. So yeah. you know, and if if no one else has the same question, at least your curiosity or your understanding can be furthered from Raise, yeah, from the answer that you get. For them. Yeah, right. You know, when I started this um, feedback, I call it um, forgotten the name I gave to it initially. After every, I told him, I said, Virgin, as of next week, so this is like. The, the late night, I went to Filippo, 1986. By 1988, I was convinced that people were sometimes in church sleeping with their eyes wide open. <laughs> I said, I said, Bridget, no, listen to me. As of next week, Sunday, and every single Sunday, I'm going to be raising questions of you. Listen to the, my sermons are carefully packaged, carefully prepared. They're memorable. So you should be able to follow the main point. Usually we Baptists have three, three main points, not always, but more often than not. So I say, and look, you reserve the right to ask me, the preacher, questions. So are we good to go? Some of them told me, some of the deacons said, Rev, I found that an intrusion in worship. I said, how so? You don't find it helpful? They said, well, no, it's an intrusion. I said, you think God wants you to come to church and just listen to somebody talking to you? You don't understand that you can't ask any question. So you leave ignorant as you came in. You think that's God's purpose for church? Well, they like and, to be spoon-fed, like you said, and entertained. Yeah. And then well, after was... while, they got accustomed to it. And the young people especially, oh, they, they were joyous that once in their life, now they get a chance to talk back to pastor. Mm -hmm. And years later, after they had gone abroad, I was, the, the guys from Filippo, old days, the youngsters had a reunion and invited me to address them. One of them told me, say, Rev, you know why we used to always ask you questions? Because we know you're not free to answer the question them. Yeah. That's how they learned, they said, and they took it as fun to come up with the hardest question at Bible study and at church to ask me because they know I would try to find an answer. If I don't have it, I would search and find it and come back and tell them. It makes uh, a world of difference. It yeah. causes, causes problems for other pastors who don't like that intrusion or whatever in worship. Because when I leave as a guest preacher, they fear their people might want the same thing mm -hmm. as what Chisholm did. So it's not happening. One preacher, a name won't be called to protect the guilty. So says, ask them deliberately. You enjoyed worship. Hey, man, hey, man, hey, man. You would like it to happen next week. Again. Hey, man, hey, it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> so so that nonsense. Yeah, someone put in, the, put in the chat, preaching gets people out of the world 
teaching gets the world out of them by the power of the Holy, Holy Ghost. That's cute. I will borrow that and probably make it better. <laughs> no, I'm like in Japanese, they say you invent it, we make it better. Right, right. The next time that person hears that comment, you might say, but hold on. That sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't, don't be aware of that. <laughs> I'm sure they won't mind. The crowd, they won't mind this name. Properly, yeah. <laughs> right. But I mean, it's 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 true. And then, you know, there's there's a lot of us who are uh, as believers too that they, we don't want to answer some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't we don't want to be able to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. you know and um you know i i tell people all the time i don't know is an acceptable answer oh yes the yeah. only person who should be embarrassed i think i've said it here i said in my in my philosophy classes my critical thing whenever i teach i tell them i say look the only person who should be embarrassed by ignorance is an omniscient person and only god qualifies nobody else on earth right we're all ignorant of something yeah. i don't know is an innocent honest answer yeah so when you say, Rev, you know your home lesson is no humility, is honesty. I know what I don't know, and I know jolly well what I do know. Yeah. And then it saves yeah. them, saves, saves them from you sending them down the wrong road. That's right. You know. I, I think I think to, um a lot of us pastors have created a kind of situation where uh people need to sit down and listen to us and take everything we say uh, uh, for granted, or you know, yeah. that, that, it, that is it. Uh, and it is not up for any kind of criticism or questioning. Mm -hmm. uh, and right. if, there, if there's anything like that, then it seems like uh, an insult. And right. in fact, uh, maybe if it were a situation where people could, um, if, if we had to say our prayer meeting and Bible study was to, consider the sermon that was preached on Sunday. Sunday, right. And, and what did you get from it? Mm -hmm. And so on. And, and for somebody to say, Pastor, you said this uh, this sentence or, or or you said this word or whatever. What did you mean by it? I didn't get mm -hmm. it. Uh, can you explain that? Uh, but but, uh, but um, a, a, a lot of preachers, I think, including probably myself, even I would want to admit it, is, is that you, you don't want to be questioned. Uh, uh, you know, because um, it, we're not as bold as you to say, you know, I don't know. You know, we want we'll try to sort of beat around the bush to give some kind of answer that mm -hmm. we, we think sounds, uh, you know, plausible. But, right. but in in truth and in fact, if we what we should have done is go on and do a little bit of study ourselves again, and come back, and yeah. come back with right, with, right. with a, a plausible right. answer or a real true answer instead of dodging the bullet. Mm -hmm. And I tell students when we do um, preaching seminars for young preachers, I tell them, I say, look, never underestimate the congregation that you're going to be preaching to or before. No matter how small, no matter how deep rural, respect them enough to prepare thoroughly. You never know. A specialist in an area might just pop into church that morning. Mm. And what you're saying, if it doesn't make sense, you look like an idiot. <laughs> I always prepare for a specialist popping in. That, that's, that's my standard approach. I don't know who will come to church. Somebody who knows more Hebrew, more Greek could, could fault me and say, well, Brother Chisholm, you meant well, but you blundered at A. I am open for that. I don't know everything. I am open to be taught. Yeah, and then that's, that's the thing, I guess, uh, some preachers, uh, and even I guess some people think of preachers that they should know everything. Yeah, right. You know, that yeah. they, they, they know all, you know, they, they, you can just say, you know, all right, what is, uh, you know, what is Genesis 3 verse 14 say or whatever, uh, you know, and you're supposed to reel it off, mm -hmm. you know, From memory, yeah. right, just, just knowing it and then break it down, you know, point A, point B, point C mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, Brother D, you had your hand up. Um, I was I was going to win on on the the the, the part as where where Chisholm co commented earlier as far as what he brought on Sunday, and um, one of the things for me is if it's if it's if it's spirit led, then 
to me, there is no reason to defend or justify uh, for any reason to why I did what I did. If the Lord wanted to switch up whatever it was for whatever reason, then mm. so be it. Right. Um, right. And, uh, and in, in that, in that personal um, <laughs> assignment which the Lord bestowed on you to do, I don't think there's no reason to defend it. But uh, I guess another an angle I like to come from is that, uh, you know, to those who know me, it's not a stranger. I've preached before. And uh, uh, even when I do some form of teaching, uh, I have people who call me back after and said, I didn't like what you said here. It sounds like you're talking to me, even if I wasn't. <laughs> um, I get that. I get that often. I got that last week. I did a teaching about David. I mean, Solomon and I don't know, um, his brother, and I said something in it. But anyway, and they called and says, I felt like you were talking about me. But here, here's, the, here's the point I want to make. Um, <laughs> I've been criticized where, where somebody has come to me and said, oh, he's preaching up there and he's playing on people's emotions. But how am I playing on somebody's emotions if I'm being led by the power of the Holy Spirit? And if the Holy Spirit has brought you into a realm of persuasion on the preaching, just like when Paul, like you mentioned earlier, when he said to Agrippa, and Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Why? Because Paul is telling him about this testimony. So if you're in a realm of persuasion, how is it you're playing on somebody's emotion? I'm yeah. not playing a love song to let you think about your wife. I'm letting you focus on the holy and almighty God. So I think there is a, a misconception a lot of time with people as far as maybe the assignment that God has bestowed on the person because everybody has their own perception. That's but right. if the heart of the servant is in line with the spirit, then I don't care what man thinks, and neither should you, Chisholm. I, I agree with you, my brother. You know what, there, Don? Like this, this came to mind. You, you and I have talked about this um, before. I believe where that is, where that goes, what you were just saying, is that people know when they're doing so, when when they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing mm -hmm. or they're not doing something they're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. you know so then you go out now and you know as being led by the holy spirit and you just lay it out plain uh revergism i think he said it when he was here and we use it here all the time everybody has a corn toe mm -hmm. everybody has a corn toe and you know you know you may be slipping as as how you you treat your spouse or maybe even how you're doing on the job or maybe your 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 um your your service in church or your tithing whatever everybody has a thing mm -hmm. and if 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 rev comes now whoever comes and brings a message on tithing when you know you haven't tithed for the last nine months it, oh, nine yeah, years. oh or or years <laughs> god forbid what, oh oh what oh happens? oh the, the 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 finance ministry go show rev my statements my record and, and 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 tell him to go preach on it mm -hmm. so he's talking about me right so you know um and we've said it here we have to check ourselves every day precisely you know you know renewing of our mind you know and stuff every day mm -hmm. you know am i doing what i'm supposed to be doing so that's that's where i i think it gets to people because they, 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 and it, that means that it's actually working because they have to, they have to take what you're saying, uh, the Holy Spirit is saying through you, and apply mm -hmm. it to their right. situation, and they know that they're doing something that they're not supposed to, or they're not doing something not they're doing supposed they to. to be doing. Right. So, if, you know, if, if if you're preaching and you never match anybody's thought, you're not preaching at all. I see you or something. Or everybody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> because because everybody has something in their life Everyone. that is causing them to uh, consider their position in terms of uh, their relationship with God and wanting to do what his will is. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes there are preachers who go up there and the message, uh, I believe like Dan says, God gave you that message and That's you it. preach it. But That's sometimes it. what, what happens is that we don't preach what God gave us to preach because we are too scared as to the reaction to it. Uh, you know, somebody saying, yes, I, I, I told the deacon about this problem I have. And I must tell the preacher, pastor, so that him come now, come preach for me and, and stuff like that. You know? Not coming back. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but um, we, we need to, it, it's, it's just a pity that, that um, you know, like now when we don't have Sunday school, 
because Sunday school should be the place where people can indeed, in, in a lot of instance, get some of their questions answered. That's right. You, you know, because uh, the, the preacher said so and so and so on Sunday, if it's not, not him there, or say, you said such and such a thing on Sunday. What did you mean by that? Or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And then he can, and they can leave there saying, oh, I, I get it now, I understand. That person is now educated to a certain extent and mm -hmm. can be, and the messages are beneficial. But if, if, if they never ever get any kind of answer to the question because there's not, not opportunity, then they will just be a kind of ignorant what's going on all the time like that. But that's exactly. if they but that's if they wanted the, the question answered. If if I feel you're poking at me, all I want to I don't I'm not gonna ask you what you care. I'm just gonna say why are you poking at me? That's right. That's right. You know, they, they have to want to go further than maybe, all right, this is my situation. Man, pass the touch on it, you know. Let me see if I can clarify it, mm -hmm. not not pointing at myself that I ha I'm in that issue, you know, and maybe the answer he gives me, I can apply to my situation and hopefully get out of it or be better from it or whatever. Um, you know, a lot of us are, we're human and we have our emotions and we're, some of us are, are sensitive. Right. And, you I, know, I have heard time and again from students, especially when they, they tell me that when they ask a question, so Sunday sermon was done, they come to Bible study and they raise a flip back to Sunday morning. Pastor, so you touched not the Lord's anointed. <laughs> how is touching you as a preacher? Or how is asking you a question, touching the Lord's anointed? Uh, it, it baffles me to no end. Yeah, it's it, it, a popular thing. They shut up people by, by using that verse, touch it, not the Lord's anointed. It, 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 that that preacher must be the, as you say, the, 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 the fourth head of the, the, the Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So don't question me. <laughs> yeah, right, right, you know. But Chisholm, is it isn't that a foolish comment comment? Oh, no, no, it's them, them, it's them box totally, Jeremiah, them box totally Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah, they all of the prophets them get rough rough up. So I mean touch not the Lord's anointed. The Who anointed has been shown biblically that you can be touched. That's right. Is that you have to you have to trust in God no matter what happens. Yeah. So to me, they, they abuse that scripture. Oh, yeah, it's misquoted, it's misused, you know, and they, they put themselves on some pedestal like you're untouchable. Mm -hmm. You're That's not right. untouchable. You I, can I, be touched. I believe it's more, of, it's more of, you know, as far as a, uh, I, don't, I don't think manipulative is the right word, but, you know, as, try, as far as something like trying to, to set up somebody or trying to do somebody harm, mm -hmm. not, not in questioning somebody no that's that should be if if i say something or i'm trying to i do it with my kids all the time you know i'm trying to show them something or teach them something they they may have a question because i may have used the words that i don't they don't understand i may have showed them a diagram that you know they can't grasp and you know all right what do these squares mean dad or what do these circles mean and I, oh i showed it to you already you should know mm -hmm. you know no that's 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 not what it's 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 there for and, and some people are not going to ask questions because yeah. they speak to somebody that, you know, a brother or a sister that they know, who know a problem that they have. And, and immediately that person get up to ask a question. That person say, well, yeah, you know, you have that problem or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore, sometimes the person who asks a question because he, he knows if he asks a question, there are fingers that are going to be pointing at him. Yeah, I think it's her. your personal problem. It could be a hypothetical question. Yeah. It has nothing to do with your personal life. But that's how people are. But for me, I tell people when I'm preaching, I say, look, I'm not going to be scared of the, the big, the big um, money givers in the church or the people who are power, power brokers in the society. I have 66 friends in the Bible I don't need anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not going to be scared of anybody in there, no matter who you are. Preach the whole counsel of God for anybody and everybody. That's right. Are you sure you good? Uh, I think it's a classic case of um, becoming a victim so that you don't have to change. Um, a lot of times people are like, you know, oh, I didn't change because they were always preaching at me. 
<laughs> or oh. they were always, you know, like they, there's a, 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 we find it at schools all the time. The teachers, I mean, the parents come and they say, you know, um, oh, they didn't do their homework because they just didn't understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did they ask a question? That's right. Did they take any notes? Did mm -hmm. they even, were they awake in class? So there's yeah. no, um, there's no obligation on the part of the person that, you know, has something to learn to make their own learning or to have, as Damien said, have that um, desire yeah. to learn. There's just this, um, this, I mean, and it's very rampant in our society. I mean, in whole, and lawyers are making a lot of money off of it. And many foolish cases are being won off of um, becoming a victim when you're the one that did something wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, you broke into somebody's house and now you're getting paid for it because you hurt yourself <laughs> while you broke into their house. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Like you create yourself as the victim. Um, and as I couldn't learn that because I didn't like the way you presented it, you know, or I couldn't learn that because, you know, you, I, I couldn't change because I was too upset because they, they mashed my corn, you know, it's not, um, it, it's, it's very, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a tactic that the enemy continues to use to keep people in ignorance and in darkness. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, um. And I sometimes complain about it too, because I know in having to help, I know my wife too, having to help the, the kids with some uh, like homeworks that they bring home. It's like, they didn't show you? said, no, they never taught us in class. And I, if I'm trying to help them to, you know, make sure they get ahead and stuff, I have to take my little time and read and, and, and find out and internet and all that kind of stuff to make sure I can help, you know, my child if they, you know, if they happen to fall down a little bit. But, you know, those teachers have their issues as well, you know, coming from mm -hmm. home and they may have an off day, but, um, you know, no matter what, you know, my, <laughs> my wife says it to the kids all the time. Listen, I'm trying to help you. I have my degree already. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm trying to help you, you know, so, but, um, you know, we still have to, you know, always be willing to learn and willing to realize yeah, we don't know every, we don't know everything. The law of the teacher must be matched by the law of the learner. You must have a willingness and eagerness to learn. But the average child in school and the average adult in church sometimes just come because they have to or they want to protect their image as a church goer, but not really to learn Bible. Yeah. And the, 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 the motive for coming to church is just wrong. Yeah, or or I've, I've heard this for, you know, 40 years. So you're saying something different so i'm not going to you know i'm going to throw you out and just keep what i have instead of trying to figure out is what he's saying valid or not mm -hmm. yes sir d yeah I, I i remember i was visiting now should i say the church name yeah metropolitan and i was able to speak to one of the older gentlemen there and um, one of the things where we had a little dispute about repentance. And he said, I'm a Christian, I don't have to repent. And I looked at him and I said, yes, most of you uh, older Christians believe that. And he looked at me, he was quite astonished. Older Christians, I said, yeah, you're stuck in your way. And uh, I remember texting him a couple of days later, showing him that, you know, Israel had to repent, even though they were a redeemed nation. But anyway, he didn't like it. Mm. And he said to me that... Um, don't text me no more on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I have made up my mind and that's it. But what I wanted to say, it is um, not that it has always been what I've done, but I would say 70% of late or even more. You know, most of the things I, I, I like to, to hear teaching and I try to listen to a lot of orators. I like to listen to different, you know, I'll go to YouTube and look for the guy with the least views and listen to what the Lord has said through him. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and when you did your last message, you probably don't remember, but I came up to you because it was relevant <laughs> and it was, it was on time for me, right? Yeah. And what I normally do now, what, how I normally get inspired, you know, cause I do get to preach on occasion and teach is I get inspired when the word cuts me first 
Yes. And, and normally I'm going to be honest with you. 70%. Notice I'm not saying to you it's always been like that. But I'm saying to you now, I am preaching to myself half of the time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when, when, when the word, when you connect with the word, wrong, when the word connects with you <laughs> and it starts something in you, I think that's where you, you're even more passionate on preaching it. Because yeah. not only has it spoken to your heart, but no, this is just not a, a, a general word you're sharing with mm -hmm. somebody. You're, you're telling somebody, yo, God help me in this, you know. Power in this, you know. Deliverance is in this. And when you preach it with that, you understand sometimes, I don't know if people miscon can misunderstand the zeal or the passion or the intent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we get this too much um, uh, in flinging stones. We're not flinging stones. We're trying to change life. You understand? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why I look at it now. It's not a rock stone thing. You can't joke with the, the, yeah. the, the altar or the pulpit of God like that. But it's a misconception and teaching will help get the church in a place, I believe, where they'll be able to receive yeah, um, stronger messages and stop ready to uh, be offended at them, you know? And then it's, like, it's, like, uh, it's like we're yeah. saying, you know, we have to, they, we, you know, we would hope the people will get beyond, all right, I know I'm, I'm going to use tithing because we said it already. I know I'm not giving. And, and and I know, I and Daddy may correct me if I'm wrong, I know Daddy used to kind of stay away from it sometimes. But then the Lord would always use the preacher that would come in when daddy was taking a break or out of town. And that person will, would always touch on giving. You know what I mean? Because they would think, oh, mm -hmm. the pastor's looking at the, 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 the spreadsheet that comes yeah. in and he, he sees zeros by my name. So he knows I'm not giving and I'm in church today. So he's preaching on me. Mm -hmm. But then like Don is saying, instead of, instead of that, Take what is being said. If 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 they go back and they look at the, the 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 scripture that was used in the giving message and read and some understand, because I've I've known people that um, come from different places and they've gone to church and they never heard of ten percent. You know, as far as tithing, and we've covered that where you know it can be it can be whatever for the giving, but they've never heard that. So, but it's it's up to them to take what is said. Yeah, but we just have to be open to the word. Right, and apply the it word to their lives. Convicting me, let me trust God, confess where I need to unchange. Yeah. Most of most right. most, most most people are sorry, Dad. Most people are looking to say, boy, this was a good message. I wish sister or brother so and so was here. Is that church? Today. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, bro. Um, brother Clint. Yes, my brother. Do you think that there is something to be done or improved on the whole matter of homiletics in college, in this theological college? Oh, yes. And what is concerning me more is the, the content of the structure of the information at places like UTC. For instance, uh, and I have to call his name. You guys look, maybe don't, I don't get the glean about concerned Anglicans. Well, one of them is in my Greek class. And he and his wife and his daughter are very concerned about one of their Anglican clergymen, Father Sean Major Campbell. So they would send me his um, liberal views that he spouts in the press and apparently writes very, fairly regularly. And they're very concerned about the confusion that he's causing in the minds of people in general who would read his columns. So my last piece that appeared about the controversy between the, the maiden, the maiden virgin controversy, Isaiah 1 and Isa and, Ma and Matthew. And his, his snide response, you know, is that we, we sometimes see magic in scripture and call it miracle. Yeah. And call it what? Miracle. Uh oh. So my response to him, I call him by name. I said, My brother could not possibly think that I would need an education on the distinction between magic and miracle in, this, in the biblical texts. He says Genesis, Genesis 1 to 11 is myth. Is myth? Myth. And I chided him in a, in an, a column in the, in the Gleaner on that. Absolute rubbish. He does not know Hebrew. If he knew Hebrew, he could not say that the Genesis text is myth. Because in, in myth, you don't find the verb forms that you find in Hebrew in a mythical text or a, or a, you know, a non-literal text. The, the, doc, the writer is documenting history revealed to him by God. 
but at the at the theological seminary sometimes what the lecturers are giving the students is you know the students go there for bread and they're giving them stone crumbs crumbs yeah man pathetic but that's the reality that we are facing in our modern world the, the make your own determination kind of thing. yeah we have to beef up our, our people in the world to understand to you know ward off some of the false doctrines and false ideas that can be pervade even from a so-called evangelical pulpit yeah i mean it's it's I, I always come back to jesus's temptation i say it often so you probably heard me say it before jesus is being tempted by the devil in the in the wilderness he's using scripture mm -hmm. he just took out he left out a no or left out a not or yeah, something right, like right. that the or one or two words is left context. or kind of flip the beginning to the end or whatever this you know, and if you don't know, you're like, boy, that that really sounds like it comes from the Bible. Yeah. You mm. know, oh, I remember reading or hearing about that. Yeah, all right, maybe that's how it goes. Yeah, and then you know that's Run how you it. start getting led um, astray. Astray, right, right. Like you know, um, I, and I think I said it here last week. You know, like uh, for, forgive and forget. Mm -hmm. That's right. not the Bible, right? It's not in the Bible, but you have some people who are sprouting it like it's, it's gospel. They can't find out. Yeah, it's not there. So, because, I mean, next you know, week, I, that's it. Next two weeks, God willing, I think I'm going to present my uh, two part on distinctives. Distinctives denominationally and distinctives religiously. The first one I'm going to ask us to hold our denominational distinctives lightly, but hold our religious distinctives strongly in a pluralistic world so that be next week wednesday and the following wednesday god willing mm -hmm. all right guys have a good night lord all bless right. reverend register you mind closing us out a word of prayer please yes let us pray gracious loving father and our god help us to make the best use of the time that we spend going through the scriptures and seeking to dig deeper and deeper so that we might be nourished spiritually because we are approached by others and Lord we want to be able to speak the truth in love to them and uh, to guide them in your word to show what your word says because uh, not, not just something we know but it's something we believe and accept as followers of yours. So we just thank you for our brother Clinton and for the efforts he put in to share with us. And we ask that you would help us to take in as much as we can in order that we might deliver it to others who might come in our pathway that you have sent for us to aid and assist them in their development and growth. So thank you for tonight. And as we separate now one from the other, we ask that you would continue your, your hand of blessings upon us and keep us safe until we meet again. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Night, night, brethren. All right, brother. Night, night. All right, good night, everyone. All right. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Guidance.